a mother-in-law so consumed with rage, with anger over her daughter's divorce and subsequently not having visitation with her grandchildren that she commits murder? She murders her own son-in-law over visitation? It's really hard to imagine that. You know, so often when we hear about a violent crime, many people will make excuses. Oh, they were under stress. Um, they grew up in a bad family. They're, they, they're uneducated. They're this, they're that. They, they were using drugs. They were uh, using alcohol. A million excuses. Let me tell you about this mother-in-law. Her family, highly educated, called a five-star family by politicians, uh, lawmakers, um, rabbis, friends of the family's neighbors. No one within their circle can accept this woman, the matriarch of a very wealthy, very educated family, would ever do such a thing. But guess what? I agree with police. She did it. She had her own son-in-law murdered because he refused to give up his children. I can hardly believe it. You know, women, um, grandparents, in-laws all over the world only wish their son-in-law would pay attention to the children. Be a good father. Show up. Be there. Nurture. He was doing that. And now he's dead. Shot in the head. Because of the mother-in-law? Are you kidding me? Sadly, it's no joke. It's real. I couldn't make this up. I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us here at Crime Stories and on Sirius XM 111. It, 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 it's a lot to take in. Let me just start with our friends at Crime Online. Donna Adelson, the mother of recently convicted murderer Charlie Adelson, is caught by police trying to board a plane leaving Miami and heading to Vietnam. Her husband Harvey is with her as police take her into custody. The latest person to be arrested in the murder for hire plot killing of Dan Markell. WFSU reports Donna Adelson is now in Tallahassee and will be held without bond in the Leon County Jail. In charging documents and a warrant request, prosecutors noted that on recorded jail phone calls, Adelson discussed killing herself and leaving the country following Charlie Adelson's conviction. He is facing a mandatory life sentence. Three other people have also been convicted in Markel's murder. Donna and Harvey Adelson had one-way tickets purchased for Vietnam. Vietnam has no extradition agreement with the United States. Okay, let me understand this. With me, an all-star panel to make sense of what we know right now. But first to Joel Waldman joining us out of this jurisdiction in Florida, host of Surviving the Survivor. Joel, the mother-in-law. First of all, who's Charlie Adelson? Charlie Adelson is the brother-in-law. And he's not just the brother-in-law. He's apparently a very well-respected periodontist. This is the brother-in-law of the dead husband, the dad, Dan Markell, the law professor. So I, I want to first start with the mother-in-law trying to flee the jurisdiction to Vietnam. But this is just after her son is convicted in the murder. Let, let's just start. Why is the mother-in-law at the airport with her husband, Harvey, with a one-way ticket to Vietnam. Tell me how that whole thing went down. Well, Nancy, in a, in a word, she didn't want to be arrested, and she knew that it was coming, and it's really a remarkable story. It's one of the most fascinating true crime stories that you'll probably ever hear uh, uh, of. Hey, Joel, just right yes. there. I'm a crime victim. My fiancé was murdered shortly before our wedding, and I know... It seems fascinating, and I agree with you. The dynamic here is 
fascinating and interesting. It's kind of like looking at one of those beautiful snakes under a glass case. It's, you know, fun for some people to look at them. To me, it's revolting. It's revolting because I remember what it feels like to have the thing you love the most in the world taken away forever. So when we say fascinating, remarkable, um, I've been to a lot of murder scenes. The blood gets sticky. It's got hair in it. It smells. And almost within a couple of hours, the victim, there's some kind of a smell attached to it. I can't describe it. It's horrible. So when we say remarkable and fascinating, yes, I agree with you. But these children are growing up without a father. And I find it revolting. I find it horrible that they would do this. No matter how angry they are about the divorce, they would do this. So with the victim in mind, I want you to tell me everything you know, Joel Waldman, because you know a lot. Yeah, I mean, I could not agree with you more about the way you, you rephrased me there, Nancy. And I have to say that I'm in constant touch with uh, the Markell family. And uh, everything we do on the podcast is really uh, to get uh, justice ultimately for Dan Markell. What a lot of people don't know is that this happened over uh, nine years ago. So they've been waiting for justice uh, all these years. Uh, the two convicted hitmen are in prison, as is the middle woman. But just to get back to your original question, about Donna Adelson, uh, it was on a Monday that Charlie Adelson, uh, the ex-brother-in-law, was convicted. And then exactly a week to the day, Donna Adelson is arrested at Miami International Airport, which is just a stone's throw uh, from where I am sitting. And what we found out since then is almost immediately after Charlie's conviction, Donna and her son, Charlie were on the phone for 35 hours that week. Good Lord in heaven. Her getaway. 35 hours in one week. Guys, you're hearing Joel Waldman. He is the host of an incredible podcast, Surviving the Survivor. Um, Joel, don't lose any of those thoughts. Because I've got to tell you, just talking to you at the beginning gave me chills all up and down my arms. Because I'm thinking of my husband, who I love so deeply. He's a saint. The thought that someone would take him away from me and my twins who need that father figure so much, it, it's very upsetting. Dave Ehrenberg is joining us, Palm Beach County State Attorney and friend of Dan Markell. Also with me, Tamara Demko. Um, I've got that she is a doctor, a, a JD, an RN. She went to Harvard Law School. But aside from all of her education and her achievements, she's a close friend of the murder victim, Dan Markell. And again, this case is like, my, my, my head is spinning around with all the ins and outs of this case. But to break it down, this law professor... Uh, Dan Markell, young, uh, attractive, devoted father. He goes out of town. He comes back. Half the furniture is gone and the children are gone and he can't find the children. That starts a very acrimonious divorce with Wendy Adelson. Okay? It's her mother that just got nabbed on a one-way ticket to Vietnam, dragging along the father. What did he know? Harvey. Is he just along for the ride, or did he know anything? Long story short, David Ehrenberg, before I go to Tamara, Dave, I heard you say something that I researched intensely. You were describing Wendy's brother, the brother-in-law now convicted of murder, and you referred to him as the maestro, and you mentioned he drives around town in his Ferrari and his name tag, I mean, the license plate actually says the maestro. Yes, Nancy, it's good to be with you. Yeah, he is uh, someone who's very self-assured and someone who That's one way to put made it. a lot of money. <laughs> right? There was a book by Bob Woodward years ago about the maestro. I think it was Alan Greenspan, how he controlled the world economy. This is how he sees himself 
in that same vein that he controls things. So, you know, that's a pretty interesting piece of evidence to show that this guy, self-assured, to use a euphemism, is the kind of guy who would help plan a murder and think he could get away with it. He, because he just is smarter than everybody in the room. What, they can't read that sign at the jail that says this is being recorded? Hello? Exactly. You know, he was so cocksure of himself throughout the trial. The fact that he took the stand and spun this preposterous lie that he was the victim of extortion, which made no sense. And he believed he had won over at least one member of the jury. And so he was shocked. You should see the face when oh, he walked yeah. in after a short deliberation because he knew his goose was cooked. And he just put his head down. Like, I can't believe somebody has finally called me on my SHIT. He finally, finally had to answer up that he arranged the hit on his sister Wendy's husband. With me, correct, Tamara Demko, a, a, a very dear friend of Dan Markell's, was living in Tallahassee when Dan was murdered. Tamara, I, I hardly even know where to start, but why don't we start with the day of the murder? What happened? Good to be with you, Nancy. Um, I did not find out about... Danny being shot until he had already passed. So the 19th of July, um, I received an email from a law school friend that said, I just heard what happened to Dan. Are you okay? And she knew that I was very close to Danny. So I went to Facebook and I looked and I saw the awful news. And it was, it was horrifying because he was shot in broad daylight um, before noon on the 18th of Friday. I was working two miles down the road while my dear friend was being murdered. And the thought um, was just horrifying. It, it broke my heart to hear the news and it, it was very devastating. Tamara, I, I think you'll agree with me. Women all over the world only wish their husband would take the children to school in the morning, do the school run. I, I happen to love it. That's my favorite part of the day. but. Be involved, play with the children, do something with the children. And I mean, I got lucky because my husband does. But so many women feel that it's all on them. And here's a guy, your friend, Danny Markell, who is fighting tooth and nail for his children. What, if anything, do you know about his battle with his wife and his in-laws over the children. I think you're absolutely right, Nancy. Um, Danny was just so passionate for life, and he was most passionate about his boys. He was a, a loyal friend, someone who would go out of his way to see you and to support you, and he was just a blessing to everyone he met. But the boys were his life, and he would even take time out of his schedule to go meet up with the boys just for snack time. That's the kind of dad he was. He would also sing them to sleep at night, and he would play with them. Um, he was just a wonderful, wonderful dad, and the boys deserved and still deserve to know him and who he was. The divorce was very contentious, and boy, that's it was one a, way to put it. it to me. <laughs> I mean, because it was, it was, did um, I have those facts right? That he goes, he's a professor. It was it's FSU, correct? Danny Markell was a professor at FSU, a law Florida professor. State University, correct. And uh, was apparently in the academic world very well regarded. He was also devout. And everybody jump in, please. Karen Stark, Robert Crispin, Dr. Gorniak, Joel Wallman, Dave Ehrenberg, jump in because Joel Wallman. I'm diverting away from Tamara, but I want her answer. Isn't it true that we find out the mother-in-law, Donna Adelson, she quit work and spent her whole life cultivating her three children like they were hothouse plants, going to the right schools, going to the right camps over the summer, getting this award and that award and the whole shebang. And I'm not denigrating that. I'm applauding that, but isn't it true 
that she tried to get Wendy to bribe Danny with a million dollars to give up the children, essentially, and let them move seven or eight hours away to be close to her, the grandma. And then when that didn't work, she wanted Wendy to threaten to raise them as Catholics. Yeah, and have them baptized. And they were devout Jews, thinking that would throw them over the edge. And Wendy, to her credit on that, well, ostensibly, would not do it. it didn't that happen, Joel Waldman? Yeah. Nancy, this is, just shows you how demented uh, the matriarch, Donna Adelson, is. At the wedding, um, obviously, prior to all the acrimony, uh, Dan Markell, as you just mentioned, was becoming more and more involved in his Judaism. Uh, he really wanted a kosher wedding, and lo and behold, uh, at the wedding itself, they pulled all the kosher food. It was something that was perplexing to the Markell family. They couldn't understand it. They had friends who were coming who would only eat kosher food. And then as things heated up and as this divorce got more and more whoa, contentious. Whoa, 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 Joel, wait. Isn't this, <laughs> was this the big wedding with 200 guests in Boca Raton? Yes, it is. And it was in the New plus, York yes. Times. You know how hard it is to get your wedding? I did not try, Jack. You don't look at me that way. I was lucky to get it in the Macon Telegraph. Oh, and the headline was something like, Grace secretly marries, husband converts. From da Baptist to Methodist, okay, <laughs> converts. Anyway, something to that effect was in some paper. Long story short, it was so big, it was in the New York Times. Lavish. Wait, I, I, this is the first I've heard that they pulled the kosher food. Who pulled the f kosher food? This is uh, the Adelson family. They pulled the kosher food and uh, all the guests there, you know, probably a good portion would only eat kosher food. So there goes... Uh, the, the wedding meal for a lot of people. And, I bet uh, Markel threw a fit like nobody's business. Nancy? Yes. Karen Stark, what psychologist mother in at KarenStark.com. Karen with a C. Go, Karen, go, go, go. <laughs> the mother-in-law may have given them a, a wonderful education, but there are no good values or morality that we're talking about. They didn't seem to get that at all. What an outrageous story. You have guests who can't eat any kind uh, of food. Karen, a you do know food. there's been a murder. So let's not get it's, too hung up on the wedding. That's, Although that's I agree one with example. you that, I the mean. Thing that, I know, Nance, but you know what? The thing that really gets to me the most should have been a the murder sign right there at the are the children. Yes, I um, agree. Back to the children. Good. Thank you. Let's get the ship right and back out of the weeds and back on the road. And since we're so much on the road and we're out of the weeds, Joel Waldman, isn't it also true that there's a third sibling? You've got um, Wendy, who was married to the murder victim. And to this day, everyone insists she knew nothing about the plot by her mother and brother to kill him. You got Wendy. You got the brother, Charlie, who's convicted of hiring a hitman to kill his brother-in-law. And you've got a third sibling that was in love with an Indian girl who was Hindu. And the parents, the Adelsons, threw such a fit, he broke off, married someone that they would accept. That marriage fell apart after a couple of years. And he went back to his original first love. And they're together today. Is that right, Joel Waldman? That is 100% correct. Uh, there is just such thick irony here. And I have to say this because... My, the, the podcast is called Surviving the Survivor because my dear mother is a Holocaust survivor. And this Jewish grandmother, Donna Adelson, at one point threatened to have her own Jewish grandchildren march down the streets in Nazi uniforms. Uh, Dan Markell was too Jewish. Dan Markell was too Jewish. But Rob Adelson marrying a non-Jewish woman, uh, she was just beside herself. So they dug their noses into that relationship, insisted that Rob Adelson, the now estranged son of the Adelson family, marry a Jewish woman. He did for a short time. He was not in love. And then later he reconnects with this Indian doctor, this woman, and now he is happily married and completely disconnected from the Adelson family. Dave Ehrenberg, I can't, I, I'm having a hard time believing what I'm hearing. Yeah, it, it, it is. Uh, Joel, 
is 100% correct. Uh, they are not going to win Parents of the Year. There was an article that came out from a supporter of the Adelsons, which was a little suspicious because of the timing. It looks like perhaps it was from a paid uh, supporter, someone who said he's known the Adelsons forever, and they would never do something like this. They must be innocent. But then it was revealed that the author of the piece hadn't spoken to the Adelsons in 25 plus years, hadn't seen them in more than 25 years. So they don't have a lot of defenders right now, Nancy. And the big question is, if and when, and we expect it to be a when, Donna is found guilty, what's the next shoot to fall? Because I don't think prosecutors will be done there. You mean you believe prosecutors are going to go after the father-in-law, Harvey Adelson, who was with Donna Adelson on his way to Vietnam, didn't he go, hey, why are we going to Vietnam? I mean, <laughs> or why do we have a one-way ticket to Vietnam? Uh, we're not coming home? Okay, there's that. Yeah, you know what that is. Yeah, yeah there's that. And uh, several of the phone calls that are under suspicion, of course, the feds got in on this. Guys, we cannot sign off without talking about the bump, okay, which I'll get to. But his phone, Harvey Adelson's phone, took a lot of the phone calls around the time of the murder. Um, but you know what? Let's bring it home. Let's bring it home just a moment. Let's take a listen to our cut to the 911 call. Dan Markle, father of two I mean, beautiful boys. Don't show their pictures. Um, dead. He drops them off at school. He goes to work out. He's in his own garage, sitting in his car. I don't know. On email. Oh, he's on a phone call. Making calls. And he's shot in the head. Listen to this. What was the, uh, how old is the patient again? I'm sorry. I can't tell. He looks maybe 35 or 40. I don't know. Okay. And is he awake? He's just moving his head around. But he's not responding. I've, I've called his name, asked what's going on, or not called his name, but asked him what's happening. He's not responding to that, but his head's kind of rolling around. Okay, is, is he conscious? Well, I can't tell. Okay. Is he breathing? I can't tell that. I'm assuming he's breathing if he's moving his head around. Did you ever hear him talk or anything? No. Okay. You said he's sitting in the car, right? Correct, in the driver's seat. Okay, where driver's exactly seat. is he? In the driver's seat? You know, in the driver's seat. Is he in the garage? or In the garage. Okay. To Tamira Demko, she is a doctor. She is a JD. She is an RN. She's a Harvard Law School classmate with Danny Markell. She's known him since 1997, was at work a few blocks away when Danny was murdered. When I think of this I, I know he was brilliant. I know he's a Harvard Law grad. I know he's a, a law professor, wrote all sorts of very impressive works of legal acuity. I, I know that. But a dad so involved, so full of life, it's very hard for me to take in that his own in-laws would have him killed. Very hard for me to wrap my mind around that, too. It's, um, I've, I actually grew up in the same town as the Adelsons. My family's home is a mile away from their home. And I guest lectured for Wendy Adelson in her law school classes. Um, it was really something that I did not want to consider as a possibility. And it's heartbreaking in and of itself. Tamara, of course, you were not on Charlie Adelson's jury, the maestro, but now that you are seeing the evidence unfold, what do you think? I think that there was a very concerted effort and a long time planning. Um, I believe the Adelsons are planners. I'm very grateful for everyone who's worked hard for justice in this case. And I firmly believe and hope that justice will continue to happen and will continue to seek it to the point where everyone involved is held accountable and that a callous disregard for life and the cold calculation of the murder is not something that a self-serving, this kind of self-serving premeditated and heinous act should never be viewed as inconsequential and repeated by anyone. And that's the just kind of justice that I'm looking for. Tamaric Demko joining us. 
did you know Donna Adelson, the mother-in-law? I had been to their home in Coral Springs. I had also been to Wendy's home in Aqua Ridge. And yes, I've met Donna several times. I've, I've had drinks with her. I've had dinner. I've gone to high holiday services with the family as well. Can you just tell me what she is like, what Harvey Adelson is like, what Charlie Adelson is like? There are people, even when confronted with the evidence, and it's pretty strong evidence, including $56,000 in cash put in the go-between account, Charlie Adelson's girlfriend who hired her, who arranged for her common-law husband uh, and his friend to do the hit. Her account gets all this money poured into it. The hit men get money. And Charlie Adelson, hey, Dave Ehrenberg and Joel Waldman, jump in if I've got this wrong. There are a lot of meticulous facts in this case, but Charlie Adelson had a habit. He, whenever dealing with cash, would staple the money together. I've never seen that in my life. And they would get cash stapled together. Is that right, Dave Ehrenberg? That is correct. Uh, it's like a fingerprint. You know, that was a really unique is. thing that only Charlie did. And you know, for the defense lawyers, they had a problem. How do you explain that the killers had in their possession these stapled stacks of bills? How do you explain it? Well, Charlie, I think that he built his defense around that, where he tried to explain it by saying that he was the victim of an extortion plot. And that's why he had to pay the killers or else they would kill him and his family. Well, of then course, how it didn't come make he's any still sense. alive? <laughs> well, and and that's like, and also it's not how extortion works, where the killers go and first murder your enemy, and then they come back and they say, okay, we've killed your enemy. Now we're going to kill you and your family unless you pay up. Why not just skip ahead to just say, pay us, or we're going to kill you and your family? So none of this made any sense. He but hated that's Dan what Martell. The had to do. Charlie. Correct. Charlie Adelson hated Dan Markell. So that theory is completely bass-ackwards. Um, exactly. It made no sense, and the jurors didn't buy it either. Tamara Demko, back to you. I was asking you, what were the Adelsons like, specifically Donna? Donna seemed like a, an involved and loving mom. She was... Um, great to have chit chat conversations with and she was very proud of her children um very much involved with the grandchildren as well i think from the surface level they seemed like a normal family if you were to go to their home in coral springs there are pictures up on the wall of the of the kids um she she spent a lot of time supporting wendy there was nothing abnormal on the surface just trying to take in everything. I would say. What? Go ahead. I would say that Harvey, Harvey always came across as a little bit more quiet, but certainly friendly. And Charlie was very lively. He was always on the go and enjoyed partying quite a bit. Dave Ehrenberg uh, joining us, Palm Beach County State Attorney and friend of Danny Markell. He has been re Charlie. The, Charlie Adelson has been referred to as thinking he was James Bond, but in fact, he's a periodontist. What does that mean? Well, I'm from South Florida, and as Joel uh, and Tamara would say, uh, that's not that uncommon. He loved the fast life with his Ferrari and his fast women and his clubbing lifestyle and drugs, and he was well known that he was involved with steroids. And here was a guy who was a nerd back in high school who then became this wealthy, flashy, fast-living guy who thought that he could get away with murder. And that's the kind of person who would commit this kind of crime because people said, why do you think you could get away with it? Well, when you're uh, hopped up on steroids and you think that you're smarter than everyone else, yeah, you think you're above the law and you wouldn't get caught. And it took nine plus years for there to be justice for and Charlie. the and FBI. God bless the FBI.
God bless them. Look, I was a Fed for three years. I hate the federal government. Except the IRS, <laughs> I love you. Please don't look at me. Um, Joel Waldman, could you please explain what I'm talking about as the bump? The, Charlie Adelson would never have been convicted of murdering his brother-in-law over visitation with grandma and Donna Adelson would not be in a jail cell up in her 70s trying to flee to Vietnam right now if it hadn't been for wiretaps and surreptitious recordings. One of the most amazing ones that actually worked, Joel Waldman, and I'm going to hear from Robert Crispin and Dr. Gorniak, a renowned forensic pathologist. I want to circle back to Dr. Gorniak on what Danny Markell experienced because when the neighbor came up, he was still rolling his head around and moving, which in my mind means he was suffering after he was shot. Joel Waldman, as it's called, the bump. If Adelson's had kept their trap shut, they wouldn't be in jail right now. Tell me about the bump, as it is called. So the bump is now a, an infamous FBI sting. So the feds got involved uh, once this case started to move and they thought that the Adelsons uh, were possibly involved. So uh, it's interesting you bring it up. I just did a tour for my podcast of the location where the bump happened and it happened to uh, take place right in front of where the Adelsons were living. The icon. An iconic, the, the iconic. The icon. Yeah. The icon. Yes. Yes. And and it's a very lavish building. I think units start around two million dollars. Whoa, so, whoa, whoa, whoa! The, the Icon Condo building, the units start at two million dollars. That is correct, Nancy. Uh, welcome to Miami. Yes, and it's it's interesting. This tour I did, I was curious to see these different spots. So I also went by Charlie Adelson's house, which is completely. Oh, not wait a minute! Did you, you video that? I did. It's on my website. On oh, the YouTube channel. so we can see. I, I, I can't wait to see this. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so, so Charlie's house is nothing like what you'd expect. It's sort of a rundown home right off the highway. And keep in mind, this is a guy who in court admitted that he was making three and a half million dollars a year between 2014 and 2018. So that goes back to the James Bond question, because that is not really the salary of a periodontist. But we do know uh, through these wiretaps that he was Ill illicitly dealing steroids as well. But back to the bump. So this bump happened right in front of this icon building in South Beach. It's a beautiful area. You can literally, uh, this is what's so sad. You can literally take a stone from where the bump happened and throw it and it hit the school that the two uh, Markell children attended. And Donna was on her way to pick up her grandchildren. Her you grandchildren mean after they killed Danny Markell and moved the children down to South Florida, right? That's where they're yes, going to and, and change their name from Markell to Adelson. So these two young boys have are going to have a lot, a lot. And Nancy, I know you know this, you know firsthand. A lot of grieving to deal with, and a lot of um, you know understanding about what happened to their family as they become these young teens that they are now. Not but only this changed bump, their last name from Markell back to Adelson the maiden name of the mom, but took away the oldest son's middle name, which had been the Hebrew name of Dan Markell's grandma, right? So all trace of Dan Markell has been removed from their life. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to process. It really is. So um, this, you know, this bump happened literally across the street from the school that they were attending at the time. And ultimately uh, when they got the, uh, you know, that video and audio, there's no doubt that that is, you know, a big piece of evidence that um, influenced jurors. And then there's one other piece of uh, audio from a, a restaurant, the so-called Dolce Vita yeah. tapes that had the middle woman, Katie McBanawa and Charlie Adelson talking. So it's a combination of this evidence that people believe. Let's blew start this with the bump. Right the bump is a fad pretending to be a bad guy literally just comes up and kind of bumps into the mother-in-law, Donna Adelson, outside of her $2 million condo. And he has like a press release about the killing and says, he, you tell me, he wants $5,000. Yeah, uh, he wanted $5,000. 
basically scribbled a number down, said that he was a brother of the person in in prison, implying that he's uh, one of the hitmen, Luis Rivera. And as soon as this bump happens, Donna Adelson immediately is on the phone with Charlie Adelson, and they are once again, as they had been doing many times before, speaking in code. Right, like hot not- belly pig. We can't figure out they're talking about the cops. Yeah, yeah it's um, it's disturbing. It's it's, but it's also intriguing, but very very you disturbing. You know what? Uh, if I tried, even tried, Robert Crispin, uh, Robert Crispin joining me, private investigator, former federal task force officer for the U.S. Department of Justice, now CrispinInvestigations.com. Robert Crispin, can you even imagine me trying to talk to my husband in code? I mean, when he drives through yeah. McDonald's, they're like, what did you say? Much less, you know, so trying to, who talks in code? And not only this, Joel and Dave jump in if I'm wrong, but she says something like, I just got handed some paperwork. We need to meet right now. And the Brother-in-law goes, is it about me and you? And she goes, whispers, probably. And he goes, what? Probably both of us. And she like yells it. And instead of, she goes, we can't talk on the phone. Well, right there, that's a red flag. So they meet right. at the condo and they go outside. They won't speak inside their condo. And they go huddle off in the corner beside the pool to have this conversation. Right. And the whole time the feds are watching them and recording everything that's being said, that's not normal. If a guy comes up to me on the street and went, hey, I want $5,000, I'd call the police. You know, Nancy, the, the, the bump operation is usually used when things start to get a little cold or we need to start tickling, as we call it, tickling the case to get some more leads and to get some more people involved to start getting some more information or probable cause to start you know, taking people out in this. Um, this worked extremely well this did exactly what it was supposed to do it got them talking and it took it to the part where they were able to get an indictment and an arrest on these guys you know along with all the other stuff that has been going on since the homicide with how this all started with a grainy image of a prius and it just spiraled from there all the way to where the fbi took it to the bump and i think with everything from the time they had the grainy image to getting the second image from a bus stop that gave them a transponder to having high-speed detectives understand that that transponder is out of a rental car. They got the transponder report data from, from the turnpikes. They tied a particular car back to Miami. They pulled the rental agreement. Lo and behold, on the rental agreement was a phone number that tied it back to one of the guys involved in the killing. They pulled the GPS data. They pulled the cell phone data. It gave a bread trail from Miami up to Tallahassee and on the day of the murder, stalking around the victim's house. It all started to come together, but it started to get a little bit cold and I think that's when the bump took off and it did it. Yeah, we call I mean, that a chance they encounter. knew who did it, but they didn't have the evidence. And so they wire up an undercover cop, a fed, he goes and bumps into the mother-in-law, demands money on behalf of a hitman, and instead of calling cops, she immediately meets with the brother-in-law, her son, to discuss, hey, am I in trouble? Uh, I'm going to put what Crispin just said in non-cop talk. So they get a grainy image, probably off of a, a doorbell cam, a ring cam, a sum cam, of a silver Prius at the murder scene at Danny Markell's. Then they get a transponder. They get uh, information about that Prius, like um, there's tinted windows. There's a missing uh, side mirror on the passenger side. They get all the part of a screwed up trailer hitch on the back. The transponder is from that Florida, is what's it called, a uh, Sunshine Pass or a Florida Pass, where you can go through sun all pass. the tolls? That's the transponder. That's the Sun Pass. Sun Pass, yes, that's it, that's it, Robert Crispin, uh, who's joining me from Florida. And so they trace that Sun Pass back to a rental car and the hitman and his cohort's name. They trace them to the girl, Charlie Adelson's girlfriend, who works in the dentist practice. The rest is history. And, you know, another thing, it, 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 is this true, Dave Ehrenberg, 
that Donna Adelson, the mother-in-law, gets on the phone. Hello, you're being recorded. And says that she's putting her affairs in order to, for the grandchildren that she's fought so hard to have near her. And she's either going to commit suicide or leave the country to a non-extraditable country like Vietnam. She actually says that and it's on tape. Yeah, she went to uh, and spoke with Charlie while Charlie was incarcerated after he was found guilty. She was on the phone with him telling him that she had her affairs in order, just like you said. And that's how law enforcement knew that she was about to bolt and they stopped her when she was on the jetway, walking onto the plane, literally, and stopped her in Harvard. She almost got away with it because once she goes to Vietnam, it's very hard to get her back. Uh, the bump worked spectacularly well, uh, as you said, Nancy. One thing that was interesting to me was how Charlie reacted when he saw that someone was trying to extort his mom out of $5,000. So Charlie wanted to kill the person who tried to do that. How dare you try to extort us for $5,000, which made it so much more preposterous when at his own trial, he said that when he was extorted by Katie Magbanua and the killers, he willingly and quickly gave over the money, pretty much no questions asked. And after he couldn't afford the full payment of three hundred plus thousand dollars, he entered into a payment plan with these gangbangers. So idiot. this is why the jury. Yeah, he's an idiot. I've saved Dr. Jean Gorniak to the end. She is incredible, brilliant, board certified forensic pathologist, former medical examiner, Clark County, Las Vegas. As you know, I love to say, Dr. Gorniak, never lack a business in Las Vegas. Dr. Gorniak, I want to talk to you about Danny Markell, who I believe was shot in the head. And if I've got that wrong, anybody jump in and correct me. But the fact about when the neighbor came up, Dr. Gorniak, he was still moving around, still alive. And it makes me feel nauseous thinking of him sitting there. He's just dropped his children off. He comes home. He's making probably business calls. And the person on the other end hears a loud sound. He's still alive, Dr. Gorniak. Is he thinking about his children? Is he thinking, what the hell just happened? I just, is his head hurting? Is, is he in shock? He can't feel anything. What happened, Dr. Gorniak? Nancy, you're correct. He was um, shot in the head. Um, from what I've read, he had two gunshot wounds of his head, one in the forehead and one in the left cheek. So it is consistent with him being in the pass or the driver's seat of, of the car. He also had gunshot wounds or um, injuries from gunshots on his left forearm. So he either could have seen one shot coming, you know what I mean? Or his arm was just up on that left-hand side of, of the car. So injuries to the brain, there's only one thing that kills you instantaneously, and that's what we call injury to the brain stem. And that's where your respiratory center sit, where your cardiac center sit. So if you have an injury to your brain stem, that would call in, cause instantaneous death. In this case, it's apparent, because he was still moving, that his brain stem was not injured. So in a case like this, um, he had brain injury, so his brain isn't working properly, but he's not dead. He obviously, when the gentleman who found him, he said, obviously he's breathing because he's moving his head, but he's not speaking because of the injury of the brain it, itself. Um, I can only imagine what's going through uh, Mr. Markell's, you know, you know, mind at that point. Um, obviously it, it was, he was obviously caught off guard, um, has probably no idea what's going on, but I can only imagine that when he does realize that he's injured, that he thinks of his family. Um, it's, it's just, it's sad to think about that. Um, but also he has to fight for his life. I mean, because he was fighting for his children when he was alive, you know what I mean? All he wanted to do was care for his, his children and now this is happening. So I bet his children were, you know, literally on his mind in that moment. 
And unfortunately, we know he didn't die right away. He survived hours in, in the hospital. So um, it was just them trying to keep him alive, trying to um, save his life. Um, he fought. He, he fought until he couldn't fight anymore. I want to go to Dave Ehrenberg and Joel Wallman on a question that Jackie here has just sent me. It's my understanding that at trial, Wendy Adelson said the reason she changed her children's names was out of fear because Nancy Grace put their pictures on TV without blurring their faces. Now, I've also been told that I did a hit on ABC and was speaking about the case and that while I was talking, the children's pictures came up. I, I don't know if that's what happened or not. But when exactly Dave Ehrenberg or Joel Wallman, did she change their names? I think it happened pr pretty quickly. She immediately moved the kids down to South Florida as she and her family had long wanted. And then uh, as soon as she could uh, remove the name of, of uh, Danny Markell, wiping out his history as their father. Joel, uh, that's my understanding. Would that be correct? Uh, yeah, that is uh, as I understand it. I wasn't in the courtroom for that testimony, uh, Nancy, but I can assure you she did try to throw you under the bus, and I can tell you that is not, unequivocally not, why they changed the family name, but uh, that is what she appeared to uh, hang on to, at least during her testimony. It's been proven, though, that while she's on the witness stand, she has perjured herself um, multiple times, and some people have even wondered if that's going to lead to some sort of perjury charge down the road. Now, wasn't she given limited use immunity? Yeah, Dave, I'm going to let you take that one. She was, <laughs> and you can speak to that. Yes, she was. <laughs> uh, yes, and so that limits what they could use. But look, if they established evidence independent of her testimony against her, then it's game on. And they have some evidence against her. It's not as compelling as the evidence against Donna or Charlie or the others, but and it's circumstantial. Uh, but there are a few things, like why was she in the area right after her ex-husband was shot? Why, why does she lie or, or uh, seem to not tell the truth on the stand when she said that she didn't see the cop and she turned around and she took this Trescott Road, uh, which was a shortcut, when none of that really made sense because she seemed to have driven out of her way to go buy some liquor, which a liquor store was close to her home as a gift. And then to be in her uh, Danny's neighborhood on the same block right when it happened looked like what happens when you are someone who commits a crime and you want to see the fruits of your labor. And then there are other things like talking in code about the TV. So it looks like she had a lot of information about this, but whether they could prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, I think they're waiting to see what, they, what the, uh, the calls that Donna made. Maybe they are incriminating. Maybe getting Donna's cell phone can help point the finger at Wendy, because right now I believe the prosecutors don't believe they have enough evidence to charge her. Is it true that according to an ex-boyfriend, Wendy Adelson said many months prior to the murder that her brother, Charlie Adelson, was looking for a hitman to kill her husband? Uh, she, she told investigators that right away. As soon as the murder happened and she was brought in. She threw her brother under the bus saying that he used to joke about, here's a TV, it's cheaper than hiring a hitman. And so that her brother, you know, uh, didn't apparently didn't like that too much. On the stand, he admitted that at times he had felt negatively towards Wendy. So if there's any Adelson family member who will flip on another, I think the only shot here is that Charlie facing life in prison will flip on Wendy. We know that Wendy Adelson was at one time officially named an unindicted co-conspirator. But as of right now, there's no indication that she will be formally charged and named in this murder. Goodbye, friend. Guys, thank you for watching Crime Online with Nancy Grace here on YouTube. To get the very latest, subscribe to Crime Online here.